Hello everyone, welcome to Nature Live, the online show where we meet the people from behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London, as well as a variety of special guests to talk all things natural history. Who here likes hats? Some of us might enjoy wearing hats most days, perhaps a baseball hat. In the winter, we might keep warm with a woolly hat or in the summer, wear a summer hat to keep the sun off our face. Or perhaps you only wear hats at very special occasions like a wedding. Well, a hundred years ago, the hat world looked very, very, very different indeed. Victorian women could be seen wearing some of the most elaborate, colourful and eye-catching hats you could imagine. Adorned with bright feathers from birds from around the world, this fashion came at a cost, the rapid depletion and near extinction of many bird species. Today, we're going to be exploring the story of the remarkable woman that decided to stand up against industry and government and put a stop to the devastating trade in bird plumage. This year marks 100 years since the establishment of the Plumage Act in the UK, an act that outlawed the trade of, of exotic bird feathers in fashion. Who were the pioneering women who stood up to government and industry? What birds were on the brink of extinction? And what role did the museum play in this remarkable early conservation success story? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by not one, not two, but three guests today. From the Natural History Museum, we have Catherine Rook, who is an archivist at the museum and works in the extensive archive collection. Hello, Catherine, it's great to have you here. Hi, Alistair, it's great to be here. Joining Catherine is colleague Alex Bond, who is senior curator of birds at the museum and is responsible for looking after over a million bird specimens. Hello, Alex, thanks for joining us. Hi, Alistair. Great to be here. And finally, to help us explore this story, my final guest today is freelance journalist and writer Tessa Bose, who has written extensively on the Plumage Act and the stories of the people involved. Thank you so much, Tessa, for joining us today. Thank you, Alistair. So as always, to you at home, if you're watching uh, live, please do send in your questions to our guests today and I'll put them to them. This really is a fascinating topic and there's going to be lots to talk about. So uh, pop those questions in the chat and we'll get to them as soon as we can. All right, well, to start us off, Tessa, um, could you uh, start us off by telling us um, what exactly was the Plumage Act? Um, what, did, what did it mean? What did it, what did it do? The Plumage Act, or the Importation of Plumage Prohibition Act, which was finally passed 100 years ago um, in 1921, this was to stop the import of bird skins, essentially, to the Port of London, to Britain. And Britain was very much the fulcrum of the plumage trade. So it was first put before the House of Lords in 1908, passed, and then stopped by the House of Commons, foot dragging, time wasting, um, vested interests. Twice in 1913, it was put back before the House of Commons, thrown out, not enough time. Um, finally, back it went again, 1920, 21 passed. They didn't want to see this act passed because so much money was being made by the plumage trade in Britain. And that's why it took 13 years to get it through the House of Commons. It's incredible. And we're going to find out just how tough it was to get to get this act through and the incredible work that in particular a group of, of pioneering women were, were doing in, in trying to get this through. Um, and I think uh, we'll find out that it's quite inspirational. I think certainly I find it quite inspirational to think, you know, the, the, we'll talk about the, the scale of, of the industry here. Um, but we can see uh, in some of the images here, Tessa, what the bird plumage was often being used for, um, which is these elaborate hats that I alluded to in, in the introduction. So let's take a look at some of these because like, they, they're quite unlike anything we would probably see today, to be honest. That's right. When I started researching this, I thought you know, plumage, it sounds very sort of free and Edwardian, the odd lolling feather. And I started looking through the old trade magazines. These are from the millinery record. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Whole birds, often several birds on heads, a, an extraordinary look. And as you move forward through time, the hats get more and more elaborate, they get bigger, the pile up of avian body parts gets just more extraordinary. And clearly this was a fashion that bird life just, it, it couldn't be sustained because every civilized country in the world every woman of every class wanted this look 
And when, when you look at the actual hats, which are in archives today, they're pretty shocking. Um, it, this, this is not, not something that uh, we think of when we think of feathered hats. Um, yeah, it's funny, I just sorry to interrupt you, Tessa, just looking at this one, for example, it's kind of, by today's standards, if you saw someone walking around with a hat like that, you would, you would be sort of appalled. It's like you've got dead birds on your head, <laughs> you know, like you wouldn't necessarily see it as a thing of beauty or something you'd aspire to to, to look like. It, it shows yeah. how, how much tastes have changed, I suppose. Yes, and I think you were wearing a hat like this, you were signalling that you could afford it. Um, you know, it was probably coming from, from the British Empire. There was this exoticism to it. There was an absolute craze for novelty within the military, military fashion industry. Um, and so many new species were being brought to Britain within this time span. Um, yeah, that there was a, a great kind of um, mania for the new, the exotic, the undiscovered. I think mm. that's what this, this hat is probably all about. And there was there was one sort of particular look and particular bird that was very desirable, wasn't there? Yes, the egret feather. And I dread to think how many birds had to die to furnish this particular hat from just before the First World War. Four adult birds died for one ounce of feathers. I've got an egret plume here. This is a Victorian millinery adornment. Um, it's wired at the end. Um, this is dyed black. And by 1903, an ounce of this nuptial plume that only rises from the egret during its nesting season was worth twice its weight in gold. And so fortunes were being made by plumage hunters around the world. Egret colonies wiped out. They were on the brink of extinction um, by the, the turn of the century. This became the sort of central plank in, in the campaign um, against murderous millinery or the bird hat. This That's incredible. The, the value of those feathers you're just describing, you know, worth as much as gold, if not more. I mean, it's it's quite, it's quite terrifying when you think about it. If it's worth that much, it will have motivated a lot of people to go out and, and get some and, and sell it. Um, you know, and if that were the case today, it would probably be no different um, when something becomes highly desirable like that. What was the what was the scale of this industry like? Because with, if there's that kind of money to be made, it, it, it potentially could have been vast. Yeah, the scale was vast. Um, I mean, the, the numbers are almost meaningless. Five million birds killed annually in 1886. Between 1870 and 1920, which is the, the kind of span of this look, 64,000 tonnes of bird skins imported into Paris and London. Uh, and it was a highly efficient, well-oiled industry. The skins were unloaded in the Board of London. They were laid out in these great big sorting rooms. You can see here, Cutler Street, where the manufacturers would look and decide what they're going to bid for in these weekly auctions. And the lots at these auctions are just mind boggling. 1888, one auction, one lot would be 8,000 parrots, another lot, 1,000 impian pheasants, 1,400 little orc and great crested grebe, 12,000 hummingbirds, that's just one lot. Um, these are weekly auctions. Um, and there is a very seamy side to the plumage industry too, which I uncovered, and that is the poorly paid women who propped it up, who worked as you know, for the feather manufacturers, the feather workers, the feather washers, and, uh, there was a lot of money to be made on the black market with feathers because they were paid very little. Here's one I discovered, Alice Battershall. She was paid five shillings a week for washing feathers. She stole two ostrich feathers, she got caught, six weeks hard labour, and you couldn't live on five shillings a week. I also found out that children played their part in this, this grubby industry. Little fingers were very good at working with feathers. Here's a family willowing, as it was called, ostrich feathers, tying frond onto frond, tiny little knots, which you can see if you look at these plumes in, in museums today, the, the tiny little peppered, peppering every frond to give that full lolling head of, of an ostrich plume that was so fashionable. So yeah, but this was a whole world utterly vanished to us today. Mm. It's just interesting, you know, when you talk about the, the different people involved, um, it's not, you know, we're not, 
we're not just talking about the wealthy the wealthy women that wanted to buy the hats but there's a whole there's just it seems to be that this industry touched every class of victorian society in in britain um whether you were involved in making the hats or or buying them um and it's which is interesting because i kind of a, I, I often thought of these hats as basically being the preserve of of the wealthy um but that's that's not the case no that wasn't the case um every woman of every class aspired to this look and um uh, yeah ostrich feathers were were particularly expensive uh, these were farmed in in the cape they weren't actually killed for their plumes so they they were allowed but um yeah but <laughs> working girls would club together to buy a single plume and take it in turns to wear it whatever was in or out with the upper classes the lower classes could then afford you know hummingbirds for tuppence in Bermondsey Market. Um, yeah, it percolated through all the classes. So this this was a very hard campaign to run. And I imagine were different bird species kind of desirable by different different classes? You know, what, what kind of birds, you mentioned the egret, for example, as being particularly uh, affected by this, but it, it certainly wouldn't have been the only one. Was there, no. was there different birds affected and appeal to yeah, different kinds of people really if, if it had wings it was fair game and british um seabird species were, were really decimated i mean the the black-legged kittiwake up on benton cliffs yorkshire nearly wiped out um, it was estimated there were 61 species on the brink of extinction because of the plumage trade including the whole heron family or the egrets the blue heron the roseate spoonbill the pelican albatross the plumed birds of paradise, scarlet tanager, that beautifully bright red bird, um, crowned pigeon, um, Indian uh, kingfishers, British kingfishers. The list goes on. It just feels yeah, like. The list goes on and on. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, I think it's quite frightening to think of the scale of that. Almost no bird was safe um, from, uh, from, the, from the trade, which is, and you begin to see what a daunting challenge this must be. Uh, if you want to stand up against it, and we're going to find out uh, in a few minutes a bit more about about the people that actually wanted to to to, to change to change this industry. Um, Alex, if I could come to you next. Um, Tessa just listed a whole range of different birds there that were were impacted, and the fact that almost no bird uh, was safe from this. We must have surely in the collection uh, a lot of birds that uh, that were part of this trade that are now under, under your care as curator. Yeah, that's right. So as Tessa mentioned, um, whole birds were used. So hummingbirds, these are all wrapped up in individual pieces of, of newspaper from Ecuador uh, in 1883. And these would have been, um, you know, plunked on whole on individual hats. Um, you know, uh, Tessa mentioned, you know, the tanagers. So, you know, think, you know, what, what's your know, tanager? We don't have them in the UK, but they're these amazing um, bright red birds here. Um, so, you know, incredibly bright red and black just to have this sitting sitting up on your head. Um, the kingfishers, so the European kingfisher that we see here with their you know, incredible blue. Um, the egrets, you know, that we mentioned. Birds of paradise. When, when birds of paradise, which are found in Australia and New Guinea, first came to, to Western Europe, they came as trade skins. Um, and they were called apoda, meaning without feet, because uh, they were prepared for trade. So the feet weren't included. And it was actually almost 100 years uh, between when they first arrived in, in Western Europe um, and when we realized that these birds that had these incredible iridescent you know, chest plates um, actually had feet. Um, they were you know, treated and, and received as objects rather than as, as individual species. Yeah, I think that really shows the very different mindset to what many of us, especially those of us with connections to the museum, would, would think. You know, we think of these as, as living, breathing animals, um, not commodities that can be turned into something that we want to sell, sell and profit from. But when you look at the the stunning feathers, you you you, you can see why um, people were drawn to them uh, and to use them. And you know, it, it wasn't just the the bright coloured feathers to go on hats. The, you know, the, the egret feathers, for example, were used in other ways as well for more sort of practical purposes, weren't they? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, the height of 
you know, your cleaning cupboard would be, of course, your egret plumed feather duster, um, you know, which we have here. You know, it's a, a massive thing. And when you think about how many of these white long plumes a single egret has, and when you look at the underside and you can see just how many feathers this comprises, how many individuals this must have come from, it's absolutely astonishing. It is, <coughs> excuse me, it looks like there's hundreds of feathers all bunched together in that for, for one single single feather duster. Just so, one. you know, the, the, the scale of this is, is, is quite, is, is quite enormous. And um, Catherine, if I could come to you next, what, as, as someone who works in museum archives, was the museum aware of the problems facing these birds and the scale? Because when to hear it talked about just now, if this was something affecting birds today, right now, we would be in full on panic mode um, that this is a catastrophe. Was the museum aware of that at the time? Yes, they were very aware. And I, I think they were in panic mode. Um, even in, 18, in the 1890s, so very soon after the SPB was founded, which I know Tessa is going to talk about by, um, by those very brave women, um, our first director of the museum, Sir William Flower, wrote a very uh, eloquent and impassioned letter to the Times where he's challenging the, the trade in plumage. And he makes it very clear in his letter, he's very polite, he's very famous for being a very courteous, polite man, that it's not the fault of the women. He says even his, his most gentle and most kind-hearted la kind lady friends are wearing these feather hats. And he's absolutely certain they wouldn't be if they knew the, the cruelty that went into collecting these feathers. And he talks um, specifically about the egret. And he quite boldly places the blame in the part of the traders, the plume hunters, the milliners who just have started in the 1890s with the rising sort of concern with cruelty to, um, to these birds. They just start telling lies about how the feathers are collected and start saying that they're selling artificial plumes. Um, and Flower, um, as uh, director of the museum, as a zoologist, is checking these plumes. And, and he says in his letter, every single artificial plume that I have checked as a scientist is not artificial. It's from an egret and they're being sold deceitfully um, and taking advantage of these women who want to be to be fashionable. And he says very clearly um, that in, uh, you know, in the, these animals are going to be swept off the face of the earth. They are going to be made extinct if it continues as it as it's going. Um, so I think there is very concern. And then it takes so long for, for these concerns to be put into bills, for that bit, for those bills to be thrown out, taken back to Parliament, and then finally passed in 1921. There's, there's quite a lineage of scientists who are panicking and trying to do something within the campaign. Absolutely. And um, of course, the museum as an institution, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a, in a minute, it's, it's, it can't just go out with placards and, and start campaigning. Um, it, 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 it has to maintain a certain degree of neutrality in a lot in a lot of issues, but equally, it can't ignore the reality of, of what's around it. Um, it's interesting what you say, uh, Catherine, about um, people being lied to, um, you know, to kind of encourage them to continue purchasing these products. We've had a couple of uh, questions and comments coming through um, online. Uh, one of the uh, this comment from Stephen on Facebook saying uh, ostriches were not killed. Uh, they were and are farmed commercially in South Africa, and, all, and although the meat is excellent, the malted feathers are the most valuable product. Um, so, you know, that, I guess that may be true, but it's very easy then for, in these days, it would have been very easy for people to just just make that up to try and dissuade anyone's uh, fears that it might there might have been suffering involved. So ostriches and poultry and farmed uh, farmed birds, that was okay. No one had any issue within this campaign with those birds um, being being used for millinery. It was the birds that were being, the wild birds that were being hunted um, and, and killed to such levels that they were going to be, um, as Flower says, swept away from the planet that is really the focus of the campaign. And uh, we had another question uh, that came in. This one was from Carmen. Uh, on Twitch saying, um, do you think feather buyers, uh, the regular buyers, not the not the traders, were aware of where the feathers were coming from? Um, and were people aware of this bill? Um, so yes, I wonder who, um, maybe Tessa, do you want to, do you want to take that one? Um, were, yeah, were people were aware? aware of this? I don't think they really gave it a second thought. It was like buying a, a fur coat. 
um, or, you know, like buying, buying a sort of Ida jacket today, do you really think about the backstory of the commodity? Um, there wasn't that, that knowledge of bird species or a sort of emotional engagement with birds that we have today. I think it was really easy to look the other way. Um, and that, that was that the work of these women was to educate, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah, well, let's let's do that now, because, you know, we've, we've really sort of I think we've got a real picture here of, of the scale of this industry and the, the the birds affected and the devastating impact it was having on on a whole range of species. And as you say, a lot of people, as you said, Tessa, we're, we're, we're probably looking the other way, not paying it much attention, just happy to have the latest fashionable hat. But not everybody was like that, of course. And um, there was a group of women in particular who I know you've been fascinated by and done a lot of work to, to really kind of raise their their profile and highlight the, the work they did. Because imagine I, I can only imagine what it must have been like to be these to be these young women in a world that, you know, this is an, uh, a, a huge industry that's making vast amounts of money that a lot of powerful people have vested interests in. Um, and yet there was a group of women that decided we're going to try and do something about this. Yes, that, that's right. So, yeah, the story starts in the north of the country, in Didsbury, Manchester. Here is Emily Williamson. She's 34 and she's so horrified by what's happening, in particular to the great crested grebe. Hardly any um, mating paired, paired species left in Britain by this stage that she writes to the all-male British Ornithologists' Union, begging them to take a stand, to, to say something, to do something. They brush her off. And in her anger, she decides to found her own all-female Society for the Protection of Birds. She invites her friends to tea, um, you know, because women couldn't book a meeting hall back then. And she gets them to sign a pledge to wear no feathers, ostrich feather accepted. And they have to go out and spread the word, um, which is exactly what happens. Um, we now have a statue campaign for Emily Williamson, because I think that her message is a powerful one. One voice can make a difference. Then down south in the same year, 1889, another group of women are gathering. And these are the fur, fin and feather folk. And there is one woman in particular, here she is, Etta Lemon, Margaretta Lemon, who gets them to focus on a single issue, the bird hat, much greater chance of success with a single issue campaign. Um, she is absolutely against what she calls murderous millinery. And the, the two societies merge in 1891, the Society for the Protection of Birds, and they together have great strength. They are brilliant at networking and they begin exponentially to grow. Their numbers keep doubling and doubling. Eventually, men are admitted as honorary co-workers because they realise they really need the men, um, particularly the men of science, those, those men at the Natural History Museum. Um, to show that they're not just over-emotional, you know, ridiculous women you know, getting in a flap about a few feathers. This really is something very serious indeed. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you say that, that not all, you know, it wasn't only a challenge that, that these women were, you know, were going up against powerful institutions, but by the very fact that they were women, that was already putting them at a disadvantage. And, and as you said, to, to help them amplify what they were trying to do they could all you know bringing in a lot of men and of course science in those days was predominantly male um they needed that to kind of help that message get through yes that that's right the men were their ventriloquists and they worked very much in tandem with each other um etta lemon was a very interesting character she she became the kind of the, the leading force um here she is a, a little few years later um T very tough, very single-minded, uh, which you needed to be to run a campaign like this. There's an anecdote that a director of the Natural History Museum hid down a stairwell when he heard she was in the building because of some bird protection failure he, he was guilty of. <laughs> she was that kind of woman. And without Etta, um, I, I don't know if this story would have a happy ending or not. She, she really ran this campaign in a very anonymous, behind the scenes, but determined way. Yeah, no, and it, it, you know, as 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 we said earlier, the, the act uh, that they were campaigning, the ban did did come in to, into play, and and as a result, that the lives of countless birds were saved. And yeah, I think you're I think you're right. You need people 
a bit like Etta, that that are really sort of doggedly determined and and quite prepared and happy to stand up to uh, to these people um, to 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 try and drive through change. And I think that's quite that's quite inspirational. You know, um, it, it would have been it's it's hard to do today. It was incredibly hard uh, for a woman to do that a hundred years ago. Um, it's it's really quite quite something. Um, Catherine, if I could come to you here, did, did the museum have a part to play in supporting uh, the women and, and and these groups that were beginning to form and and and, and um, start campaigning? Yes, they did, um, but they had a very different approach. So where the women had a very sort of emotional campaign, you can see a photograph from the RSPB of billboards. Um, the RSPB hired um, men to take these placards out and show these really horrifying, sad photographs of egret chicks left to starve after the parents had been shot for their plumes. That was the role of the RSPB. What the museum did was more sort of calculated, cool, scientific evidence collecting um, so it couldn't be emotional at all. So it, it also escaped the sort of criticism that women had of being these hysterical female feather faddists. You couldn't say that about a man of man of science. Um, so, but they used they used these women to send them information, to send artificial plumes that weren't artificial, to send newspaper cuttings, advertisements for hats, and we have lots and lots of those in the archives and correspondence with Etta Lemon, um, especially. So, so my sort of favourite scientist within this collection, all about um, the plumage trade, the Plumage Act. Percy Lowe, he was very familiar and friendly. Um, he's there in the front row, second from the left. He was very familiar and friendly with Etta Lemon. They sent letters to each other, sharing information about uh, awful things that were happening to these birds. Um, and they worked in tandem. So he um, he tried really hard. He was a very outspoken, very uh, confident man who was extremely frustrated by the tardiness of the progress of the act. Um, and what he wanted to do, um, sort of in a style of these women to be more visible, is to have an exhibition case in Hintzy Hall, which is the great hall with the whale in today, which showed very clearly um, specimens of egrets, of kingfishers, and the, the feathers that came from those to show sort of the scale of death that was needed just to create uh, one hat. Um, and initially that went to the trustees and they were very keen, they were going to pass that, but in the end it was too controversial um, it was too uh, too in your face for the museum to back. They had to really sort of be seen as more impartial than they were, but behind the scenes they were providing the facts and the evidence that were taking into Parliament. Mm. And, and and that's very much an approach I think that still exists today. That the museum is it is ostensibly a scientific organisation that uh, gathers evidence about the natural world and uses that to to to, to protect it and uh, and conserve it. Um, and it's interesting to see here that approach was happening a hundred years ago and and to great effect as it as it turns out with the um with the eventual uh, passing of the of the act um now we're, we're nearly out of time but i wanted to come back to alex at this point and just ask um you know although there is a, a happy ending to the story in some respects that the plumage act did come into force and that's why why we're talking about it today um and with it uh, many birds were, were uh, protected and saved from extinction but threats to birds sadly still exist, don't they? And I, I wonder if, the, do you draw a lot of parallels between the kind of campaign to save them uh, from the, the, the plumage trade uh, and then the challenges that they face today? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, birds today face challenges from you know, habitat loss and fragmentation, direct persecution, introduced species, pollution, um, you name it. I think the key difference between the case 100 years ago or 120 years ago or 150 years ago and today is that the cause of, of declines was so obvious. And so um, it was, you know, if you stopped putting feathers in hats, you could literally, as Catherine, there is, um, well, as Catherine Antessa said, save millions of birds each year. And I think the challenges that we face today, you know, things like intensification of agriculture, how we build and live in our in our buildings and what we do in our countrysides, I think those are much more complex um, challenges. And there's no, I guess, there's no single bullet quite in the way that there was a hundred years ago. Yeah, no, it's it's the problems are there. They've maybe got a bit more more complicated, but um, there must be some inspiration that we can draw from, from this early conservation story. Um, 
And I'm going to, I've got one question I want to um, put to you, Alex, very quickly that came from one of our viewers on, on YouTube. They were asking, um, where are the feathers uh, which were already traded in the past? Are they being used for any kind of research? Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Do we have any of these feathers, you know, from hats in the museum collection? Are they used at all? Yeah, so we, so we don't, but our um, our neighboring organizations like the British Museum and the VNA um, certainly do in their costume departments where, you know, they're used to understand both the social history, but also, you know, the scientific history of, of these species and these practices in, in places and times. So. Yeah, so they're they're informing us today still um, uh, from from museums uh, around the world. Uh, wonderful. Now, um, before we finish, I just wanted to ask each of you uh, very briefly what what you would see as the lasting legacy of of this campaign and and the pioneering women that that that, that pushed it through. Um, so, maybe in thirty seconds, uh, Tessa, are you able to uh, to sum up what you think is a sort of lasting legacy of this? Yes, I, I think they taught us to care about the birds, so our emo emotional relationship with the birds. But also that, you know, one voice can make a difference. They were up against a juggernaut of an industry. They just kept going. So, yeah, don't, don't be downtrodden. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and Catherine, what about, what about you? Yeah, I think similar to Tessa, it's very easy at the moment to feel quite hopeless about making a positive impact, positive change to, uh, you know, climate change, to threats to the environment and the natural world. And these women with such small voices really made a huge difference. Uh, so it's, it's inspiration for us today to try and do our bit, I think. Absolutely. Well, well said. And, and finally, Alex, what's your, your final thoughts on this? I mean, the, the legacy for me is is twofold. One is the fact that, you know, organization can achieve a heck of a lot once you get the right people together. But also the actual legacy of, of this movement is the fact that we have egrets today and people can see them, you know, when they go out on a walk. And that wasn't guaranteed to be the case 100 years ago. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for, for chatting to me today. It's really been great fascinating to hear about this uh this story and really quite inspirational to, to showcase the what can be achieved if you if you come together and actually um campaign on an issue like this and the real change that can come about and i think you know the world is very different today but it's it's just it's got different problems that that we need to address and i think there's a lot we can learn from from the women in this story and the and success success of that campaign and it's been a hundred years have, have passed since since that came through so I'm sure there's lots more we can do, but thank you so much uh, for talking to me today. Uh, today. It's been great having you, and um, yeah, wish you uh, all the rest in your all the best in your future endeavors. Uh, but thank you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you guys as well for for joining us at home. And uh, thank you very much for your questions as well. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. If um, <clears throat> Uh, if you would uh, like, if you enjoyed the show and want to support us, please uh, do consider giving us a small, small donation. It really helps us and uh, allows us to continue uh, producing these shows uh, and bringing more content to you. Uh, next week, we have a very different topic uh, coming to you. Uh, we're going to be going to the Triassic as we explore the world of the early dinosaurs and other reptiles. But until then, it's goodbye from me and we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. <laughs>